thanks very much to the uh, organizers for the invitation to come and speak today. Uh, I was here as a postdoc in, in 2005, so it's, it's really nice to come back and, uh, and visit. So uh, one of the advantages of being the first speaker of the conference is that I get to put up as the very first slide of the whole conference the statement of the graph minor structure theorem. Bam. So uh, I guess I'm going to assume as a given that everyone is interested in the graph minor structure theorem. This is a foundational result in the field and, and really sets the stage for a lot of different structural work. So what it says is that if I have a graph, a fixed graph H, and I exclude that graph as a minor, then any graph G, which uh, doesn't contain H as a minor, decomposes into a tree structure of graphs, which alpha almost embed in a surface of bounded genus. It's a, it's a complicated technical statement. And the version I've put here is, is purposely very sort of hand wavy. Um, because at least personally, I find it much easier to, to remember the examples that get rise to the technicalities than to try to remember just the technical definition itself. So I want to start off by doing today is just going over where those technicalities come from. What are the examples that, that force the definitions to be what they are? And then from that point, it should be fairly natural to state what the graph minor structure theorem is. And as I said, it's somewhat technical, so that'll take a, a good chunk of my time today. And then I want to use the rest of the time to talk about a uh, new proof that we've come up for, for the result. Um, and give it a high, low, high, high level overview of, of that proof. Um, with the time that remains. And let me say here that, that the work I'm talking about today is joint work with Robin Thomas and Kenichi Kurabayashi. So going even further back, uh, first off, uh, probably the thing that jumps out at you there in the statement of the theorem is, is uh, surfaces of bounded genus. So why are surface graphs embedded in a surface coming into play at all? In fact, if we go back to the very earliest results here, and this, uh, the obstructions to planarity, right? So Kuratowski's theorem showed that uh, a graph is planar if and only if it excludes these two sort of canonical graphs as a minor, if and only if I have no K5 minor or K33 minor. So what's a minor? Let me give the definition so we're all on the same page. Uh, you may have seen the definition of a graph as a minor if I can obtain it by deleting edges and contracting edges. Uh, there's another equivalent definition, which is a little bit easier to work with here. So I have a fixed graph H here, uh, my big graph G. So G contains H as a minor if I can find subsets of the vertices. So they're indexed by the vertices of H. The vertices of H are A, B, C, D. I want to find subsets of vertices x sub a, x sub b, x sub c, x sub d in G that have the following properties. So first off, I want them to be pairwise disjoint, as they are in the picture. Uh, I want them to each induce a connected subgraph. And now for every edge u, v of h, say the edge a, b here, I have a corresponding edge between the set x, a and the set x, b of vertices, namely this edge. So thinking again about contraction and deletion, for each of these connected graphs, I could just contract that connected graph to a single vertex and delete any unnecessary edges, and I'm left just with the graph H. So Wagner turned around Kuratowski's theorem, and you can use it to give an exact characterization of the graphs which exclude K5 as a minor. So I have no K5 minor. If and only if G can be composed by repeatedly gluing together planar graphs and V8. That is, I take planar graphs and then one specific graph V8, and I'm gluing together now on clicks of size at most three. So what do I mean by gluing together? Here's the graph V8. It's one specific graph on eight vertices. And K4, a planar graph. So to glue them together, We'll glue them together, I have to click. OK, so I identify two K2 subgraphs, one in each of the two subgraphs. Uh, and now I just identify the vertices on that click. And then one additional part of the definition, I'm allowed to delete any edges, oops, allowed to delete the edge of the click if I want. I don't have to delete, but I can sort of arbitrarily choose edges there to delete. 
So I'll call this operation of gluing on clicks a click sum of order at most three. At most three because I identify two clicks of at most three to glue together on. So that was K5. We have an exact answer of what the graphs which don't contain K5 as a minor. And now already when I go to K6, there's no result known. So there are a number of very complicated examples uh, of graphs which exclude K6 as a minor. And, and so far there's been no success in, in exactly characterizing what those graphs are. And, and really the family of examples are so complicated it's not clear there will ever be a nice concise description of, of what the graphs are. So going forward, we're going to be looking at excluding just a click of size KT. And I'm only going to be able to approximately characterize the graphs which exclude that click. I'm not going to be able to get an exact if and only if. So that's an, another motivation for only concerning ourselves with clicks going forward, right? If I'm excluding H as a minor, uh, but I'm only going to do it approximately, then I might as well exclude the click with as many vertices as H has as a minor. OK, so just to recall, I'll remind anyone who, who doesn't have it in the front of their mind, the genus of a graph is the minimum genus of a surface in which G can be drawn without crossing edges. And so now looking at Wagner's theorem, we might hope that the following sort of naive conjecture is true. Uh, that for every T bigger than five, there exists some bound, some genus G. So and a finite list of graphs H1, H2 up to HK such that every graph which does not contain a KT as a minor uh, can be obtained by click sums of graphs of genus at most this graph, genus at most G, and copies of the HI. Right? So this is just a generalization of what Wagner's theorem said. Wagner's theorem said planar click sums of planar graphs and this one graph V8. Here I'm saying click sums of bounded genus graphs and some finite list. I don't know. Maybe there are a finite number of exceptions I have to deal with. So I led you to what the answer, I mean, this, this naive conjecture is false. And we can sort of immediately come up with a couple of reasons why it's false. So going forward, I'm going to need to say a graph doesn't have bounded genus. What's going to be my certificate that a graph does not have bounded genus? I'll use the fact that uh, K3T has unbounded genus for big T. That is, as T gets bigger and bigger, the genus of K3T gets bigger and bigger. All right. So what does that mean? That means that any graph which contains K3T as a minor uh, is also going to have big genus. OK, so the examples that are naive conjecture is, is false. Uh, the first, sort of first easy example is apex vertices. So start with some large planar graph like I have here. Uh, add a vertex V and edges from V to every other vertex in the planar graph. So V is sort of an apex living up in heaven, sending edges down to the graph embedded in the surface. And we call V an apex vertex. So first off, it's easy to find a big K3T minor inside this graph, right? So I need three bags. One is just consisting of V. And then the other two are these long strips here. Uh, sorry, I didn't say. Well, when I'm talking about these, these X sub V in the definition of minors, I call them the bags of the minor, these connected sets right, that I have. So I have three connected sets here, and then another bunch of smaller connected sets here that send an edge to every one of the three big sets. Right? So I have a K3T minor. And so what does that mean? This graph must have arbitrarily big genus as I make the planar graph big, uh, bigger and bigger. But this graph does not contain K5, uh, sorry, K6 as a minor. And why is that? Well, again, think of what the, the bags of such a K6 minor would have to be. At most, one bag is going to contain this vertex V here, which means the remaining five bags all have to live in the plane. Right? But that would give me a K5 minor in the plane, and we already know that's impossible. You can't have a K5 minor in a planar graph. So it has no K6 minor. And OK, so remember also we were talking about click sums. You may say to yourself, well, maybe this isn't an example of one of the genus or the finite examples, but rather uh, a click sum of two smaller graphs in my class. But no, if I am a little bit careful about how I choose my planar graph, I can make this whole thing six connected and still have no K6 minor. 
<coughs> okay, so this is an obstruction. It's not a particularly hard obstruction to deal with, right? Uh, I could add to my conjecture that, well, I'm going to have to delete some bounded set of apex vertices, some bounded set of vertices, and after that, I'll embed in the plane. So in a certain sense, this is the easy obstruction to deal with. But there's another much more complicated example which comes up. So I start again with a big planar graph that I've drawn there. And now I fix one face of the graph and draw a, a, a sort of a series of crossing edges going along that. So I pick the infinite face and did a bunch of crossing edges along the infinite face like this. <coughs> so this graph is not, uh, I, I can't delete a bounded number of vertices and make it planar, right? If I delete, uh, even if I delete a bounded number of vertices, I can kill some of these crosses up here by deleting edges. But if I have many, many crosses stretching along a big planar graph, uh, I'm always going to be left with some crossing edges, which will break planarity. So, this is not a case of a graph where I can delete a bounded number of vertices and make it planar. Uh, it still contains K3T as a minor. Uh, so here's an example, right? So my three branch sets are this red edge is up on top from one branch set, the green edge is up top from another, and the long red strip here on the bottom. And each of those three connected subgraphs is adjacent to every L across the top here. So it, uh, again, has arbitrarily big genus. Uh, but this graph, again, does not exclude a, a click minor for already relatively small t. So it does not contain k8 as a minor. Uh, it's a little bit harder to see. If, if you get distracted and bored, you can just play around and show that this graph does not contain K8 as a minor uh, for fun. OK, so this leads us to another obstruction. We had these crossing edges inside a single face, and it, we need to, to deal with it some way. So we'll give a definition of the next obstruction. I want to call it a vortex. So I fix a graph G drawn on the surface with crossings, the graph that I had above here with the crossing blue edges. And now a vortex is a closed disk D such that the boundary intersects the drawn graph only in vertices and has to intersect in at least four vertices. So here's my closed disk in the plane here, drawn in such a way that the boundary intersects the drawing only in vertices. And I call the vertices on the boundary of D the society vertices. And note that as I'm going around the boundary of the disk, there's a, a well-defined cyclic order to the vertices that I intersect here. OK, so that's all the vortex is. It's a disk uh, on a drawn graph which doesn't mess with the edges. It only intersects, the boundary of the disk only intersects the vertices. OK, so maybe we want to say something like our graph has uh, a bounded number of vortices, right? Maybe we're going to have to deal with a case where I have a bounded number of faces here which allow crossing edges, right? But that's not enough. So observation. Every click, in fact, has a drawing in the plane so that there is six, exists a single vortex containing every edge intersection, right? And it's easy to see, right? So take your, your KT. T is some huge number. Fix a, a cycle, a Hamiltonian cycle in the click, and draw it in the plane as it should be. Right? So I have it like this. And then, again, I'm allowed to have a single face with crossing edges. Well, I just put all the remaining edges of the click on the inside. And now I have a single disk in the plane that intersects the drawn graph only on vertices and contains all the crossing edges. Right? So I have a single vortex. Uh, containing all the crossing edges. So I need to distinguish these two examples. This was the example I got by my planar graph with crosses along the top. <coughs> and this was my example of, of KT drawn. So I want to talk about the depth of a vortex. So a vortex has depth T if there exist two disjoint contiguous sections of society vertices connected by t disjoint paths. 
What does that mean? So look up here at the top, at the first example. I can't get too far away from my uh, slides. I get outside the range. OK, so contiguous sections of, so the society vertices, again, were all these vertices on the outside boundary. Uh, where does that word society come from? It's just the historical word that's, that's carrying over. So the society vertices are these vertices along the outside. And contiguous section just means a section on that, uh, that, that cyclical order that I have. Right? So I have a contiguous section here of blue vertices, a contiguous section of green vertices. And now how many vertex disjoint paths do I have going between those two sections of vertices? So in fact, if I divide the, the society vertices into two sets of size t over 2, I can find t over 2 disjoint, vertex disjoint paths going across. In fact, it's just going to be a matching of size t over 2 going across. So the depth of, of this guy is t over 2. It's huge. Uh, well, it's a function of the size of the click that I was looking at. What about this bottom example? Well, now, if you look at it for a second, no matter which two contiguous sections of vertices I choose here, <coughs> I'm always going to have at most four paths that go from the blue vertices to the green vertices. I'll have two crossing edges up top and two crossing edges on the bottom. One, two. All right. So the depth of the bottom guy was four, and the depth of the top guy was five. So again, we were talking about this obstruction vortices. I had a uh, drawing with a bunch of crossing edges in one face. The important thing here is that I have to include in my structure theorem, include in my statement, graphs which have a bounded number of vortices, and I also want to have bounded depth in the vortices. OK, so this is all three ingredients. This are the three ingredients for the structure theorem. I have a surface of, of bounded genus sigma. I have to take into account apex vertices, a bounded set of apex vertices. And now I want to draw the remaining graph after I delete the apex vertices with all the intersections contained in a bounded number of vertices of bounded depth. So those are the three ingredients and give us the structure theorem. Uh, but before I get there, there's, there's a technicality which I swept under the rug. So remember, we were talking about, when I defined vortices, I said uh, it was this disk. It intersects the drawn graph only in vertices. <coughs> and it does uh, intersects it in at least four vertices. So that seems a little bit arbitrary. Why four? Well, because when I'm looking at vertices of degree three, the following thing happens. So pick a vertex of degree three in the graph. Right? I have it here. And now duplicate it. What do I mean duplicate it? Just add a new vertex to the graph adjacent all three of the neighbors there. Right? So uh, duplicated there. Doing so is not going to, oops, is not going to create a large click minor. So if you think about it, the if I add that vertex of degree three with the same neighborhood, uh, the bags of the minor of any big click minor are not going to, I'm not going to get any new bags going across this three cut here of vertices. And there was no reason I should stop at just duplicating it once. I could duplicate it again and again and again and again. And in the end, what am I going to get? I'm going to get a K3T subgraph living here, right? So I get one big obstruction to bounded genus, all living there as a subgraph. Uh, and I can do this without creating any click minor. And there's no limit to how many times I can do this. I can go all over my, my planar graph here, duplicating vertices, creating a huge number of obstructions to planarity without uh, increasing the size of any excluded minor. Right. So the, this is really just a, a function of vertices of degree at most three. I mean, uh, it's not true for vertices of degree four. So this is the second off-ramp if you just want to draw pictures for the rest of the talk. So look at the grid and start duplicating vertices of degree four in a grid. And you'll be able to make arbitrarily large click miners after uh, duplicating a, uh, sufficiently many vertices of degree four in a grid. 
Okay, so we had vortices, and there was this thing that we had to deal with with, ver with duplicating vertices of degree at most three, things that can happen on three cuts. So let me give a, a sort of unified way to talk about those, uh, all that, all the, those, those two special things that are happening. Right? And we call it a, a surface decomposition. So again, we're talking about a surface sigma on the graph. A sigma decomposition, sorry, talking about a surface sigma, and we have a graph G. I'm going a little too fast. Uh, a sigma decomposition of G is a drawing of the graph in sigma, but now a drawing with crossing edges. I'm allowed to cross edges in, in the drawing. And D1 up to DK are disks in the graph. So, each DI is an open disk uh, such that its closure is also a disk, right? So I'm not having open disks that sort of reach around a handle or something and almost touch each other. No. It's an open disk and its closure is also a disk. It really is sort of as pictured here. I want them to be pairwise disjoint. So the open disks are pairwise disjoint, but that doesn't necessarily, the closures could intersect, right? But I'm specifying that the closures, if they intersect, they intersect in a finite set. They can only intersect at a finite number of points in the surface. Now, the boundary of this disk, of DI, intersects the drawing only in vertices. This is sort of the same condition I had for vortices before, right? The disk only intersected the drawn graph in vertices. And I want these disks to cover every crossing in the graph. Right? So now I'm allowed to sort of sweep duplicated vertices of degree three into a disk here and also have vortices that intersect the graph in four or more vertices. Right? So the breadth of this decomposition is the total number of vortices, the total number of disks with at least four vertices on the boundary. And the depth of the decomposition is the maximum depth of all these, of all these vortices. Uh, again, so this was the example that we had drawn before, right? So I had my planar graph, the crosses in the, in the single face, and I duplicated some vertices. Right? So here's a sigma decomposition where sigma is just the plane, a plane decomposition of the graph. I have three disks that cover all the crossings. And I have exactly one of which is a vortex, the one on top, and two other ones that intersect the surface graph in three or fewer vertices. Right? So it has breadth one, because it has only one vortex, and the depth of the decomposition is four. There, uh, we already saw with this example that the depth of that vortex was, was four. Okay, thanks. Okay, so here's a less naive conjecture. <laughs> For every t at least five, there exists a value alpha, such that if g does not contain kt as a minor, then there exists a, such that g minus a, so the a for apex. There exists an apex set of vertices, uh, such that g minus a has a surface decomposition of breadth at most alpha and depth at most alpha in some surface of bounded genus. Okay. So I'm able to draw it with crossings, but I can concentrate the crossings in a bounded number of faces. And uh, these, these faces with the crossings, the vortices with crossings have bounded depth after I delete a bounded set of vertices. So this conjecture is true, but it's, it's, we're not there yet. Why aren't we there yet? Well, in fact, this is true for every single graph. Every graph has a plane decomposition with no uh, with no vortices. Right? I can just arbitrarily draw an arbitrary graph G in the plane, uh, crossing however you want, right? And now I just put a big disk around everything that intersects the outside vertices, at most three vertices. Okay. And you're saying, well, that's cheating, right? Yes, that's cheating. But why is it cheating? So the thing is that we need to somehow force the graph, the drawn graph, to use the surface in a non-trivial way, right? It has to sort of live inside the surface. And the answer to getting around that, right, is we want to anchor it 
using a wall in the graph. So what's a wall? You've already seen it a bunch of times on the slides coming up to now. Let me give you what the definition is. So I start with a 2R by R grid, and I delete the odd vertical edges and the odd rows and the even vertical edges and the even rows. And I'm left with something that looks just like a brick wall. And I have a couple of vertices of degree one, which I delete to to not have to deal with them anymore. So this is a, a basic R wall, this specific graph on two R squared vertices, or two R squared minus two. And an R wall is going to be any subdivision of this graph. OK, so I have horizontal paths, vertical paths in my, in my wall, right? So I have the paths going across like this, and the vertical paths going down like this. So a subwall of W is a wall that actually sort of preserves the, the picture that I have so far. So I, when I talk about a subwall, I really am thinking of you know, the same picture just restricted down to a little square subsection. I'm not rotating and finding some weird subdivision like that. It's like really preserving the picture that I have. OK, so that's a wall. And I said that we're going to use this wall to anchor the graph in the surface. So what does that mean? I have to talk about what we call a flat wall. So I have my sigma decomposition like this of a graph, some big graph G, and it contains a wall W. So what does it mean for that wall to anchor the graph in the surface, anchor the drawing in the surface? So I want that wall to be flat in the surface. So what does that mean? It means that it has to not use any edges of the vortices. The wall W doesn't interact with the vortex at all. The four corners of the wall have to all be genuinely embedded in the surface. And now if I look at the boundary cycle here going around the wall, that defines a, a, a closed curve in the, in, the, in the surface that I'm looking at in sigma. So that closed curve has to define a disk. Right? In general, a closed curve in, in the torus may not is not necessarily going to define a disk, right? But I want this closed circle here to define a disk. And everything inside that disk has to be, has to, it has to contain the wall W and not contain any vortex. So I guess let me draw a quick figure. I could use maybe one more figure here. So, I have my, my torus here. The whole graph is drawn with crossings in the torus. But here's my wall. I want the boundary cycle here to actually bound a disk. That is, it doesn't uh, do something weird with the handle. And uh, if I have vortices, that's black. If I have vortices, I want that this wall is disjoint from the vortices. Not only is the wall disjoint from the vortices, but also the disk bounded by the boundary cycle is also disjoint from the vortices. Nice picture. OK. And now we can state the theorem. So it took me half an hour to get to the, the statement of the theorem. But hopefully, it's, it's, it's not mysterious at this point. We see where all these pieces come from. So I'm excluding kp as a minor. p is the size of the minor. And now r is going to be a parameter on the walls that we're looking at. So I take those as input, p and r. And now I can find constants alpha and c such as the following. So pick some huge value r. And g is a graph. w is an r wall in g. And G does not contain a KP minor. In fact, the actual statement has a little bit more uh, information about how that wall intersects with the click minor. You don't really need it for today. But it's an important aspect of the theorem. So the following holds. I can find an apex set of bounded size. Great. A surface sigma of bounded genus, genus at most p squared. And now a sigma composition of the graph after deleting the apex set of breadth at most p squared and depth at most alpha. And moreover, 
it's not cheating. I have a, an R wall W prime, uh, which is a subwall of the big one, which is flat in the decomposition. So this is a variant a restatement of Roberts and Seymour's theorem 3.1 from graph minor 16, but with uh, different values, different constants in the thing. So you may be scrolling back in your head to the first slide. And the first slide talked about uh, a tree structure. What happened to the tree structure? And what happened to those click sums that I was talking about uh, for excluded K5 minor? So essentially what we've done here is this theorem is describing the structure with respect to a single bag of the tree structure. And in fact, it wasn't uh, an accident that I picked walls as my graph for anchoring, right? Uh, if you've seen the, the grid theorem of Robertson and Seymour, right? Walls are what I need for uh, to, to force big tree within the graph, right? So, I mean, that's what's going on here is, is the, behind the choice of walls. So with the grid theorem, we can derive the whole tree structure for the graph starting from the main theorem without too much additional work. So I'm not cheating. Uh, this is really sort of the meat behind the tree structure uh, theorem that you saw in the first slide as well. OK, so that was uh, getting to the main theorem. We, we see the, the structure, uh, see the statement of the main theorem, and, uh, and I hope it's a little bit clearer what's going on with all the different components of that theorem. So I want to talk for the rest of, of today about, about how you would go about actually proving this theorem. Um, so the first step is the flat wall theorem. We already saw what, the flat wall, what a flat wall is. This theorem tells us how to get one. <coughs> so again, we're excluding KP as a minor. And we have some parameter R. And now I pick some big capital R, this, and uh, an R wall of that size and a graph G, such that G does not contain KP as a minor. And then again, I get a bounded set of apex vertices and an R subwall W prime, such that G minus A has a sphere decomposition of breadth one, such that W prime is flat. So let's see a picture. Again, I delete a bounded subset of vertices, as always. I have to always keep in my head that there's going to be some bounded apex set of vertices that need to be deleted. And now G minus A has a decomposition in the sphere with exactly one vortex. Moreover, I can sort of keep it separate from a R subwall double prime, which is flat in this decomposition, as pictured. And now maybe you're saying to yourself, isn't that the whole theorem? Not quite, right? So when the whole theorem specified that I had to have a bounded number of vortices, and the vortices had to have bounded depth, too. Uh, sorry, this was just restating what's going on in the flatness here, that the boundary cycle here doesn't contain any vortex, specifically doesn't contain this vortex. So the whole structure theorem requires that all the vortices have bounded depth. And this theorem, we don't know that this vortex has bounded depth. We just know that there's just one such vortex. So if it had bounded depth, we'd be all done. But we have to, to deal with the case where the stuff living in here does, in fact, have, have large depth. And what are we going to do going forward? OK, so the main lemma, our tool for tackling this problem. We start from the setup that we get from the flat wall theorem. Right. So go into the middle of the flat wall and cut around a, a cycle there and look at what's outside. So cut out the inside of that green disk, open it up to the outside, and what do I have? I'm left with, topologically, I'm left with just a disk right? and a graph with a disk decomposition there. So I get a, a disk decomposition with a single vortex living in the middle. Right? But the wall is giving me other stuff too, right? So as I take sort of concentric cycles in the wall around the green guy here, 
What is that giving me over in the cut graph? It's giving me a, a sequence of concentric cycles all wrapped around the vortex living in the middle. Right? So I call that, a, well, we have C1 to Cs here. Not only that, but I also have the horizontal and vertical paths of the, the wall that sort of go nicely through the, that sequence of concentric cycles. So I have red paths here taken from the vertical paths of the wall that go from the outside of the disk, that is the green cycle here, and go in a nice neat way zigzagging through the, the blue cycles until they get to the middle of the vortex here. So this is the setup I want to work with. I want to start with a disk decomposition of the graph with a single vortex, a nest of disjoint concentric cycles around the vortex, and a linkage going from the outside boundary to the vortex, which is orthogonal to the nest. That it is, it, these red paths are not zigzagging, wiggling all through the nest uh, willy-nilly. They are uh, each hitting the next cycle, traveling for a bit, hitting the next cycle, traveling for a bit, hitting the next cycle, and so on, until we arrive at the middle. OK, so the lemma says that if I have this setup, the disk graph, a single vortex, the nest, the linkage orthogonal to the vortex, et cetera, then I can get one of the following outcomes. So the first is a click minor, a big click minor. Great. I mean, that's one of the things I'm happy with. I'm, I've already excluded this as a possibility in the main theorem. One is that I have to delete a bounded set of vertices and everything that's left embeds in the disk, uh, has, a, has a disk decomposition of breadth at most p squared and depth at most alpha. Well, that's great for, for what I'm looking at also, right? Because I started with the sphere. I had just this piece that still needed to be embedded. So if I can embed everything here with more vertices, with more vortices, p squared vortices, but they all have bounded depth, then I would be done. That would be a decomposition in the sphere of the graph with a bounded number of vortices of bounded depth. OK, or the third outcome. So each of these two guys would complete the statement of the theorem of the main excluded minor theorem, and I'd be happy. What can happen in the third outcome? So it says that I have the C alpha vortex expansion of G minus A. What's that? It just means that I have the vortex here, living in the middle. And if I look at any of these cycles out here, I can group everything inside that cycle to make a larger vortex, right? I just take the disk bounded by this cycle here, treat everything drawn in the middle as a single vortex, and I've just grown my vortex to be slightly bigger. And I say that that bigger vortex has a cross cap or handle strip of width theta. OK. This is the last really technical definition. What's a cross cap strip? So H is the graph all drawn inside my vortex. This is my vortex here drawn in, the, in, a, in a disk bounded by C alpha. I draw two, I pick two curves, B and B prime, on the outside of, of this disk, like this. And I look at the vertices embedded on that curve. Here's uh, the vertices on B and the vertices embedded on B prime. I have a special subgraph H prime, so that's a subgraph of H. And it intersects the boundary only on those, on those two curves, only on B and B prime. And I tell you that H has a vortex-free decomposition in the disk, but it's twisted, right? In fact, that's why it's a cross-cap strip, because I essentially have a big strip here uh, with a twist attaching onto the boundary here and the boundary here. You can notice that there's like a nice shading here going from lighter to darker. I worked really hard on that, just pointed out. Uh, 
Okay, so that's a subgraph H star of H, right? And it lives inside, uh, lives inside H. So how does the rest of H attach to that subgraph? Well, it attaches only onto the boundary of that uh, embedding of H prime in the disk. That is, all the vertices of H prime which have edges going to H have to be embedded on the boundary here. Right. So it's a, a strip embedded in the, in the disk with a twist. Uh, and it really sort of uh, is separated off from the rest of, of H. That is, the rest of H only attaches onto the boundary of that strip. Right. Okay, so again, what we're saying here is that I have to cut out on a cycle here, and I can now glue a piece of, of the inside graph embedded with a strip into the middle. I am not going to tell you what a handle strip is, but you can probably fill it in with your imagination, right? Uh, this was embedding a strip within a cross cap sense, uh, a handle strip. You're going to be embedding two strips embedded in a, uh, as a handle onto the, the boundary of C alpha. Okay. Let's put it all together. Let's talk a little bit about how this lemma helps us prove the whole theorem. So this is the setup that we had from, from the beginning, right? Remember we had uh, the whole graph embedded in the sphere with a single vortex of unbounded depth living there, right? And I had from the wall a whole bunch of concentric cycles all around the vortex and a nice orthogonal linkage going from the outside concentric cycle to the inside concentric cycle. Those were, again, were the ones I got from the vertical path of the wall. So I have a single vortex drawn here with a whole bunch of crossings. And I apply, this is again the setup that I want for my lemma. I apply my main lemma here, and I get a, uh, closer, okay. And I get the, say, a planar, uh, sorry, yes, I get a, a planar strip attaching on to uh, this red linkage here after deleting a bounded uh, set of vertices. Okay, so this was the, the subgraph H star. Where's the rest of the graph? The rest of the graph is sort of all drawn inside this face still here, right? Now, there was a part of the, sorry, single vortex. Uh, now, the whole graph that's drawn has a, a projective planar uh, decomposition. I just added a strip with a cross graph, and so I went from being embedded uh, in the disk to being embedded into the disk with a single cross cap. There was a, if you were reading closely the, the, the slide, the statement of the main lemma, it said that we got a strip of big width. Uh, I didn't explain what it was, it just means that this planar strip attaches on to the red paths. And the red paths continue up through the planar strip, through the cross cap strip, and go back down as pictured. So why is that useful? Well, look at what's going on, right? So where's the unbedded graph? Or what, yeah, where's the, the, the face containing all the, the, the crosses? It attaches on to this boundary here and on to the boundary of this cross cap strip. But notice that that's still a single cycle, a single cycle to the boundary, right? So it's still just exactly one disk. Even though I glued that cross cap in there, there's still just one disk containing all the crossing edges that haven't been dealt with yet, right? Now, moreover, because I have all these paths going through this cross cap strip, if I go out here and cut along the middle, it's very hard to do <laughs> like this at a distance of 15 feet. But I cut along the middle here, right? And what I'm going to get is, again, exactly the setup for my lemma, that if I cut through the middle of this planar strip using the red paths going through here, I again get a bunch of concentric cycles all nicely around this disk of stuff which I still need to deal with, the single vortex. 
So I cut through the middle of this cross cap strip, take the blue cycles, and now I apply the lemma again, and I get another handle or cross cap strip attached onto the next linkage here. So now I've embedded in the disk with two cross caps, and again, I still have a single face containing all the, un, all the crossing edges. And again, I still have big uh, width here, so I still have many paths going through. So I could just keep repeating this process. <coughs> because I could cut and paste, I keep repeating and getting cross cap strips instead of also handle strips. But I keep doing this, and after p squared steps, I'm going to be able to explicitly find a kp minor just using these blue paths and the red paths going through here. That's not, it's not hard to do. That uh, I just get across. I, I can get one more edge using two guys here for each of the guys. Yeah. Let me just say, we can explicitly find the, 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 the desired KP at this point. And that's it. That's the, the proof of the theorem, that I'm going to keep applying this lemma, inductively building up the surface, Either it stops and I embed everything in the disk that remains with bounded breadth and bounded depth, or after p squared steps, I explicitly find the kp and I'm done. So uh, again, here's the statement of, of the theorem that we proved. And just a quick conclusion. So I, I said this is a shorter proof. Uh, I mean, it's. it's Hard to, to get a, a good measure of what's a shorter proof and easier proof. Uh, maybe a rough proxy, uh, rough proxy of, of simplicity is, is just the length, right? So the whole proof here is roughly 100 pages, um, which is less than the original proof, and, and it's not too bad. It says 100 pages trying to, to be as explicit as possible. So the other thing is that I didn't really say What's going on here? These, these values that I have, alpha, and so on. One advantage of being a shorter proof is that I can actually follow through and calculate what the bounds are that I'm using at each step of the proof. Right? So we get an explicit bound for alpha. And what we're getting is p to the poly p. Poly p is some polynomial. And it's, it's like a genuine polynomial. I mean, currently what we have is something like 10p to the 50p as the bound on alpha. And you may ask if that's best possible. Mm, I would guess no. I, we conjecture that, in fact, this is going to hold with alpha equal to just a polynomial in P, that we can drop down from an exponential here in P to a simple polynomial in the final answer. But uh, it would require significantly more work on the, the techniques. So I think I'll, I'll finish there and uh, say thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions? Yes. You're using alpha to bound all kinds of things simultaneously? Yes. Can you do better if you bound them separately? Uh, bound them separately? Um, I mean, not really. So the, 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 OK, so we do separate a little bit, right? So we bound the genus at p squared, and we bound the breadth at p squared here. So we're really just using alpha for the depth and the size of the vortices. And the answer is not really. I mean, those are going to be a fairly close factor because the breadth is what we're getting at each inductive step of the in each inductive application of the lemma. And we're doing p squared applications of the lemma. And then the apex set is going to grow correspondingly. So those are fairly closely tied together, the size of the apex set and the depth here of the vortex. Or to say it more accurately, I think in the proof, even separating it out, there's still going to be poly p factor between the two. Any other questions? So I have a question a bit along the lines of Paul's question. Mm -hmm. So they're pretty amazing numbers. Huh? But what exactly are the main bottlenecks, do you think, for improving them? OK. so. Clicking backwards. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so we have the, the, the lemma here. All right. um, I guess I, I didn't say. I just said for all p and, and theta, there exists an st alpha such that, right? So, I mean, you saw an earlier version of, of this, this talk where essentially we had polynomial in p times uh, theta squared. And that was actually giving us uh, p to the p to the poly p bound overall in the theorem. And knocking down this theta squared to just theta, so now it's poly p times theta, is what allows us to get down to a single exponential bound on the, the thing. If we wanted to get down to a genuine polynomial bound, we'd have to go from being poly p times theta to being poly p plus theta. And that just needs all sorts of different tools and techniques. <laughs>